Previously on AgentPalmer.com, a book about lighthouses called Sea Shaken Houses, a suggestion for supporting the content creators who you enjoy even if you don't have the money, and I'm still taking what the universe is giving me. This is The Palmer Files, episode 20, with visual effects wizard Kevin Lingenfelter, who has worked on such titles as Demolition Man, Waterworld, Preacher, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., The Orville, and many, many more. We discuss his origins and then dive into what goes into visual effects, where the industry is going, and glance at what could be a limitless future. Are you ready? Because this is happening. Let's do the show. Hello and welcome to The Palmer Files. I'm your host, Jason Stershik, also known as Agent Palmer, and on this 20th episode is visual effects wizard Kevin Lingenfelzer. As a visual effects supervisor, Kevin has a portfolio that includes work on such films as Demolition Man, Waterworld, Outbreak, Armageddon, Spider-Man 3, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, Thor, Transformers Dark of the Moon, Real Steel, and television series such as Daredevil, American Gods, Runaways, Preacher, The Orville, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., And those are just some highlights I selected out. His IMDb includes over 90 visual effects credits. I first met, or should I say, interacted with Kevin online through Bill Sweeney's side project, the Preacher vs. Preacher Companion Comparison Podcast. Yes, it's a very long title. Because not only did Kevin work on the series, Preacher, uh, and we speak to that during the episode, he's also a fan of the original comics, which is what the podcast was about. It was a companion comparison podcast. From there, I only knew some of his credits, but he was always willing to chime in on preacher discussions, whether it be a behind-the-scenes tidbit or a fellow fan's perspective. So, of course, he was the person I wanted to have on to talk about visual effects, because I know what they look like, especially the ones he's done. But that is only the tip of the iceberg, and I was interested in what layers underneath created the effects we see, what's the process, and how did he get into the industry and inspired in the first place. All of this is covered and much, much more, including where we've been with visual effects and where we may be heading to a place of infinite or limitless possibilities. It, it may be coming soon, just not tomorrow. So if you want to discuss the episode as you listen or after, you can tweet me at Agent Palmer. You can tweet the show at The Palmer Files, and you can tweet Kevin at Fuchipatas. That's F-U-C-H-I-P-A-T-A-S. You can see his career credits on IMDb or his demo reel, which are both linked in the show notes. Don't forget, you can see all of my writings and rantings on agentpalmer.com. And again, if you want to see Kevin's demo reel or his list of works, you just have to click the link that I have curated for you in the show notes, all of them in the show notes. So without further ado, let's get into it. Kevin, it really boils down to this. You're a visual effects guy, and I don't want to start at the very, very beginning, but I have to. Like, what was the movie that set you on this path? Because in all of the behind the scenes things I've ever seen, whether it's a director, an actor, or someone in visual effects, it's always yeah. like one movie that's like, that's what I want to do. Do, yeah. do you have that movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not, it's almost cliche, but undoubtedly it's the original star wars and new hope because i was seven when i saw that no actually not even because yeah i came out in may so i was six when i saw that so absolutely that but i actually have two and then alien has you know the 1979 ridley scott film has had a huge impact on my desire to go into film but those two movies, but it did start with Star Wars and New Hope. So it starts there. Yes. As like interest in film. Was yes. it any interest in film or was it like, no, I want to make shit blow up on screen? It took a little while it, for me, what kind of started with watching those films. And then I'm a huge fan of Godzilla. Okay. You know, I grew up watching all the Toho films, all the Godzilla films. And then I started to draw in, you know, 
back in the 70s, there wasn't a lot of resources available for people wanting to learn how visual effects were done. It just wasn't there. So I had to, you know, look into it and I subscribed to like the Star Wars official fan club, received their, I think it was quarterly newsletter, you know, for any insights. So that's how I got introduced to Ralph McQuarrie and his paintings and just matte painting in general. And so it was just trying to absorb as much as I could about the filmmaking process, you know, reading Starlog magazine, that was a big part of my probably teen years more than anything, Fangoria, things like that. So it was just all trying to learn what I could just from uh, reading whatever I could and absorb as much as I could. And from there, do you go to school for it? Is it, you know, like what's the process from this is what I want to do to getting there? Yeah. It's funny. I think when you talk to anyone in this field or industry or just film in general, I think the journey is very different and very individual for each person. For me, I was also huge into comic books, you know, at the same time. And so I was still drawing and in high school, I took a lot of, I was fortunate to go to a high school and I'm from Michigan. So it was a huge, huge high school and they offered quite a robust curriculum in terms of art and stuff like that. So I was able to take graphic art, figure drawing, things like that in high school. So from there, I kind of thought, okay, maybe I want to be a comic book artist. And I started researching schools and things like that, things like Cal Arts and stuff. And but oddly enough, I remember finding, it sounds kind of cheesy, but I think there was an ad in the back of a comic book for a school in New Jersey called the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Art. And Joe Kubert is this famous comic book artist, you know, he worked on Sergeant Rock and a lot of other things. And he has a very famous, you know, son as well, and Adam. So I was like, okay, I'm going to look into this. And I did. And I found out they only accept like I think at the time it was like 300 students a year so and you had very, a- very small school. Yes. I presume it's also very small class sizes too. So it's yes. like that, Absolutely. like, like a Ten. personal touch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So I researched it and found out that, you know, they wanted a portfolio. So I assembled a portfolio. And at the time, I think part of that submission process was, you know, this was before you were able to, you know, JPEGs and anything like that. So I had to submit my artwork on just like 35 millimeter slides, you know? And so I think I sent about 20, 25 different pieces of varying degrees. And at the time I was pretty proficient with pencils and and shading. So that was kind of like my, my forte in it. So long story short, I was accepted. It was a three year program. So classes included things like figure drawing, lettering. There was also graphic art, composition, storyboarding, and animation. So I graduated high school in 88 and then went to Jersey, Dover, New Jersey for the school for three years. So I graduated in 91. And then uh, from there, it was kind of like I went, I came back home to Michigan. I remember doing that and I got an art job at all things. This, this kind of like sportswear company that made clothing, collegiate uh, clothing. So, you know, it was just designing all these different sweatshirts and shirts and everything for things like, you know, every collegiate mascot. Okay. And, uh, you know, whether it be, it was primarily football though. So I did that and, I had to do that through using uh, Photoshop just, you know, in terms of, so that was helpful because I learned composition and was this just the first Photoshop. I mean, I'm uh, placing pretty, it in time. Like that's gotta be pretty early. Cause I was using like an Apple. What was it? Oh my God. What was it back then? Like a two something or something. I forget what it was, but yeah, it was pretty early, but we also did things by hand to using vellum and things like that. And it was kind of like the final proof that went to the printers for the apparel was done in Photoshop, but a lot of the early work was done still by hand. So I did that. And then as with a lot of people, you know, connections can occur. And I found out randomly that I had this cousin who lived in 
uh, Sausalito, uh, California, and she knew someone at Industrial Light and Magic. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, you know, my interest was peaked. So I started just cold calling, which, you know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, don't do that, don't do that. But, you know, my whole thing has been, you know, you just, everything that I've really wanted to get in my life, I've, I've done through just perseverance and just, you know, just hammering at it until, you know, until I got it. So this was something very much early on that I knew I wanted. So started making these calls, found out, oddly enough, though, that the name I had been given was a gentleman. He worked on Who Framed Roger Rabbit and okay. Backdraft, but he was leaving ILM to start a company in Los Angeles for Kodak called Cinesite. Okay. And I'm like, okay. So I got the number to Cinesite, started calling them and found out that, yep, they were starting this studio, Cinesite Digital Film Studios. And the very first project they were going to do was the 4K restoration of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. So, and what that entailed was basically just, it was the first time this had been done, scanning the entire film in 4K. And at the time, no one else had done this. And the idea was basically just frame by frame, you know, 24 frames per second. So you can imagine, the, I forget what the number of frames it was finally, but, and going through cleaning all the, um, the dust and dirt from each frame because when you do a traditional animated film it's shot on a what they call a down shooter type camera and there's a piece of glass that's lowered over the image and it's shot but what happens with that piece of glass is it can capture dirt and dust and all sorts of stuff so that's then captured on film so we had to clean all of that we had to make all those images look pristine all those frames are you just cleaning it cleaning it or are you also touching it up like all right there's this line is not as full as it should be for some reason so are you touching up the art too only in extreme cases okay. we were doing color balancing and things like that too but only in ex extreme cases of like whether there was like the um what's it called the rgb separation sometimes there would be chromatic aberrations or things like that in the image so we had to realign each layer the red channel the green channel the blue channel things like that but for the most part we kind of left the artwork alone it was just about cleaning it up and we did it with a very rudimentary paint program it was called spice i forget it was an acronym okay but basically, it was a very tedious process, and you basically would load a frame, one frame at a time, and you'd go through in quarters, you know, top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left, or whatever order you wanted, and just look for dirt, and then just manually paint that dirt out. There was no procedural way to really do it at the time. Is there a a time frame like, or it, I mean, obviously, it's not just you. It would take you a year, oh, yeah. like forever. It was a small army of people in the studio at the time. And then we, we ended up going to night shifts as well. So it turned into this 24 hour process to get it done. I started there in February of 93 and we finished it. I want to say, I think it was like September of, um, 93. Uh, and that was after ramping up and getting more people on it. So we did that. Hold on. I want to go back real quick. How mm -hmm. long were you cold calling, whether it was ILM or Cinesite? Like, I mean, that, that it, it was. It was probably a good month or two and probably about, I would probably wait. It was probably about 10, 10, 15 calls tops in that time, you know? I got it. Like, well, so not, you know, every hour on the hour, you know, oh, call no. in a couple of days, call a couple of days. I, I knew enough not to be. <laughs> naggy or you know your classic thing where if you if you call too much you're just gonna you know well, and, whether you're good or not it's just gonna work against you and this is the early 90s so it's yes. long distance too right yeah. like it's not it's not <laughs> cheap it's not like no. unlimited cell phone stuff so um, like you're invested in how can i yeah. keep calling without bankrupting myself and being yeah. annoying and just Exactly. It, it, that's a, that's not only persistence, like there's a balance, like a soft touch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, very true. Very right. true. So 
93 where we're back to snow white's done yep. um what's the first like meaty project that you get your hands in yeah i still remember to this day uh, in, in between that time we did several tests for like hey let's restore ben hur and things like that so we did several tests for that but then probably in fall of 93 we had several films in we got <laughs> You're going to laugh. Let's see. We got Super Mario Brothers with John Leguizamo. Okay. Um, and that had a lot of different visual effects in it. And we also got um, the Saturday Night Live, the Hackery film Coneheads. Okay. And that was mainly because the makeup on the Coneheads needed serious cleanup. Okay. You could definitely see blending issues with the makeup to the human skin. So we had to go in and I forget how many shots we ended up doing for that film. But after shortly after that though, Demolition Man came in. One of my favorite movies. Like I just there is something about that film I absolutely love. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> So at this point, what are you doing? Like, because I, obviously the touch up stuff and, you know, but yes. like the cone head sounds more like touch up. I mean, it just yes. makeup fixes what we call it. Things like that. Exactly. But for like demolition, man, um, yep. like what are you actually doing? Yeah. That was the first kind of transition into like doing what we call wire removals and cable removals and rig removals for, for stunt work. Okay. So there was a lot of that. Then there was also things like a uh, very simple 2d animation things like where an eyeball is needed for an ID scan. So we had to create the actual scanning line for that. And the actual, um, you know, just the, the, the just CG. The, yeah, exactly. But it wasn't really, there wasn't anything. We didn't really do anything 3d or okay. CG. In that. It was pretty much just 2d at that time and then one of the other things we we also did some work on was the the at the end where you know he's able to freeze um wesley snipes character that we did we did some tests there's a couple quick shots where we just did a very simple you know we inverted the image you know so a lot of times that that all automatically it kind of gets you part way there to kind of like a cold or frozen look i gotcha sure and then we embellished on top of that and then there were a couple large explosions at the end that were also added into the um into the film uh and those were practical explosions on top of like a miniature model of a building so demolition man sounds like it gets you like out of the gate when you finally get your your feet wet yeah. You're into the Star Wars stuff. Like you're working yeah. with miniatures, you're working with explosions, you're like you're you're there. Yeah, exactly. It was and what's funny is and thank God it worked this way is Cinesite was only supposed to be a film restoration company, but the gentleman that I had gotten the phone number from, Ed Jones, he wanted to transition it into this visual effects house. And so it just kind of rolled from there. And we started out mostly doing paint type work, you know, the type of stuff I told you, wire removal, cable removal, makeup fixes, things like that, small, simple comps. And we were working with a proprietary software package called Cineon. Okay. It was developed by Kodak. It was pretty powerful. And this was the heyday of, if you're familiar with, you know, SGI was huge back in these days. So all the computers were SGI. There were no apples or, you know, PCs. It was all high end, several different flavors of SGIs. Um, it was a very expensive process. And that, that was if I, uh, Silicon graphics, right? Correct. So back in 93, 94, 95, you know, it was very expensive, you know, a wire removal, you know, simple makeup fixes back then were like several grand, you know, if not more. Um, we did a lot of trailer work too, where we came in and helped just do wire removals or clean up on trailers like um, The Rock. I remember that specifically Crimson Tide. We had some cleanup work on that real quick. But over, over the years, you know, by 95, that's when our stride hit and we got three movies at the same time that were pretty big for the time we got 
um, Dark Territory Under Siege 2, which was a Steven Seagal movie, on a train. So all the train windows were green screen. And then we also got Waterworld, which was massive. Yeah, that can't that can't be easy because it's. I mean, the, they're two projects that seem the same, though, right? Like it's a lot of. Uh, we filmed in this twenty by twenty space. Yeah. The rest is green screen. Here you go, yeah. fill it in. Yes, but Waterworld was definitely, and then the other one was actually, <laughs> you know, that Free Willy Two, where we had to do uh, a lot of makeup fixes on anim- on the animatronic whales. There were seams and things like that in okay. the actual from the molding of the of the animatronic whales that we had to get rid of, and we we did the classic jump over the kid too that was a shot that was done in um cg Uh, but waterworld was definitely the most intensive one because we were also for the first time utilizing cg water and we were working with a company called at the time airte so they were pretty much just known for creating you know very authentic very realistic looking ocean surfaces so I think like the whole third act, which takes place on the, you know, the D's, the defunct kind of Valdez, the Exxon Valdez, you know, the ship from the infamous oil spill that was shot. in I think they had that set in city of industry and the the ship had to be rotoed. We didn't have, because it was so large, the set that they built, they couldn't put green screens around everything. So we had a lot of roto in that. And then the ocean surface had to be put out there. There was a lot of wire work in that. And then one of the big shots that I was able to find a transition kind of like from paint work to compositing, which was the next level, the next step where you're combining multiple elements to form a final image was the shot where Dennis Hopper's character, uh, the Deacon gets in a plane and he tries to take off from the deck of the D's and he goes over the Mariner, Kevin Costner's head and the Mariner's got this kind of like grappling hook type thing and he uses it to hook it. So I had worked on, I think the shot name, believe it or not, I still remember it was (laughs) DE 74 DE for D's. So that was a big deal because it was a big moment in the show, but I worked on that shot for like weeks. I remember, you know, just, you know, fine tuning it, getting the balance right between the, uh, model plane and the actual live action footage of Costner on the deck and things like that. And just making it look like the plane was actually on the deck was also, that was probably the hardest thing. So it sounds to me like anything, it's an iceberg. We, we don't, we only see the little top. We don't see everything else underneath, you know? You, yeah. Do you, when you're watching movies, like, like first of all can you watch movies like or yeah. is it or do you uh, have like this no the only uh, no, no no that's that's fair um yes and i actually do love watching them and i watch them for reference purposes too okay like um case in point like last night i watched underwater because it had creature work in it and i wanted to see what it looked like did it work and just get a feel for you know, how things have progressed over the years, you know, cause it was all entirely, all the creature work was entirely CG. So, which is, you know, a lot of people have issues with that, but there's, there are certain things that you can do with CG that you just can't do practically and to a certain extent, vice versa. And I now have kind of learned that I kind of prefer working with practical and kind of augmenting it via CG. Sure. That to me is kind of like the best of both worlds. And I find a lot of directors nowadays respond well to that. So as a, as an effects guy and as a star Wars guy, when JJ said before it was force awakens, you know, episode seven is going to have practical effects. We're going back to practical effects. Yeah. Were you excited or was it like, all right, what does this mean for the industry? If the, you know, if star Wars is going back to practical, like, cause as a fan, you know, mm-hmm. I'm here going like, all right, yeah, practical effects. This is great. Right. But you're in the industry. So y- right. it's it it's not a major change. I don't think practical effects really went anywhere. But mm-hmm. having a major Star Wars film go like, no, we're going back to practical effects as much as possible. Right. It, it it tweaks the industry a little bit. So do, mm-hmm. like, do you are you conflicted a little bit when when you hear like things like that? Or are you just like, well, let's see where it goes. 
No, not really. I've kind of learned to develop like a thick skin for it. Probably something that like in the case of that, I was like, okay, they're right. They're claiming, okay, they're going to do a lot of practical effects. Okay. Let's see. Let's see how that goes. And I felt after seeing the film that, yeah, they had some success with it. You know, some of the creatures to me looked practical and kind of took me out of the film, but others did not, you know, um, And that kind of is par for the course. I think a bigger issue for me uh, with what I do are things where, you know, after a film is completed and it's obviously a visual effects film, the director or the studio goes on this whole slant of like, oh, there were hardly any CG used in this, you know? (laughs) And that, I'm only bringing this one particular film up because one, I adore it. But two, it was probably one of the worst cases of this ever was Mad Max Fury Road. You know, George Miller, every interview. Now there's hardly any visual effects. There's no visual effects. There's none. None. Right. That movie had over 2,000 visual effects shots. Over. Probably closer to 3,000. Every edit in that film, at the bare minimum, had what we call a time remapping, where the frame rate was altered for some purpose. That's a very that's like one of the simplest visual effects. Sometimes they're able to do that in the editorial process. Other times, when they're ramping, let's say they shot something at ninety six frames, oh, and which was, you know, so that's four times normal. What they would do sometimes is the first half of it would be at ninety six frames, and then if it's like a fight sequence and they want a punch or something or a sword strike or just some kind of weapon hit to have impact, they'll snap to 24 frames per second. Okay. That's usually done by us because there's finessing that's involved to get that. So it doesn't just look like a a hard cut from 96 to 24. It's got to be ramped in gently. So it's those kinds of things. You know, I think the new Netflix um, Dark Crystal series made the same claim. Meanwhile, a visual effects studio, DNAG, had done CG creatures for that series. Is there a, like within the industry, is there a... Um, you know, is it like a badge of honor? Like, Hey, we, we didn't use any, like it, like what yeah, it, it is weirdly. So yeah, it's, it, it is this weird, really unofficial badge of honor of like, Hey, we didn't use any CG, you know, I mean, this is all real, I guess. Cause, cause to right. me, like the force awakens being the example, like we know it wasn't all practical effects. They didn't build the planet. Like, Oh, okay. Complete. You know, like, so there are certain things, but I, I look at your work on Preacher, mm-hmm. I, I can suspend my disbelief, but I, you know, when somebody's falling out of a plane, I believe they're falling out of a plane. I don't right. need to know whether it was visual or otherwise. And I think yes. one of the weird disconnects is that people in the industry are like, you know, hey, uh, we didn't use any visual effects. Right. And a- as fans, we sometimes hate on visual effects uh, yes. Because we've seen bad visual effects, yes. which is, which, you know, but but at the same time, when we don't notice them, which is when they're good, yes, we don't say we don't say anything. Like it's yes. it's all, it, like it should be. Hey, can you spot the visual effects? Yeah. Like they're good, and you know, it's it's not because I've come to know you via Twitter. It's in mm. general, it's weird to me because I know you know, my, my filmography goes back and I'm in love with the Bakshi stuff. Yeah. So the, 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 like the, the, the godfather of rotoscoping. So I understand the work that's involved just on that animation level. Right. So to make something look real, mm-hmm. like I get it. There's a lot of work and I always wonder like why I absolutely, if it's, if it's a crap visual effect, mm-hmm. you know, call somebody out on it. But if I can't tell, why why like i i never understood and i i i feel for you because like that's your livelihood that's that's your job so when somebody's like oh there are none even if there are like other people go oh i guess we don't need it right yeah i mean don't get me wrong the compliment i always strive for whenever i do a new show or a new project is for someone to not notice the visual effects you know except you know there are going to be instances and preacher was a good example where you know we had a a pretty awesome blending of things that were visual effects and could only be done by 
you know, CG and stuff that we did also in CG that people might have thought were practical, you know. And so ultimately, my goal is for no one to be taken out by anything that I do. So if people come away thinking there weren't any visual effects in it, I'm actually okay with it. It's the whole fight of practical versus, you know, what I do that can be a little grating at times. But, you know, we, things like um, a good example of an all CG shot that we did was at the end of the first season with the All Saints Church, we blew that thing up. That was all CG. Um, we talked about doing it practically, but the thing with doing a practical explosion on and they actually had a church built. It was only the production designer, Dave Blast, did a great job of building that thing, him and his crew. But they only built the two sides of it, the front facade and the screen left side. Oh, for and, shooting purposes. Yes, correct. So they didn't have to build it. And this was all shot in Albuquerque. So the, the advantage of doing it CG, because we knew we could do it using software like Houdini and things like that, is you get to tweak it as you go along, meaning you can embellish and add to it. Whereas if you shoot that practically, you get one shot and that's it. You know, there, there weren't any extras. There, weren't, there wasn't a second version of the church ready to go. It was just one shot, one shot only. So they had to weigh that in advance, you know, and so we knew we could. And it, and it was a particular type of explosion too. It was this massive underground explosion, yeah. you know, occurred and they wanted it to have this kind of nuclear uh, shockwave effect to it, which normal pyro wasn't going to give you because normal pyro usually is, it's just that there's a lot of pyro involved with it. And this was more of a concussive, massive thing that wiped out the church. So, so that was the other reason. Over your career, you have melded real pyro with, yes, um, you know, visual effects. Are you on set for the real pyro or is it just here's the material? Because obviously there are there's only so much coverage. I mean, you can point a yeah. hundred cameras at it and still not get it right. Like yes. so how much input do you guys have with the pyro team so that you 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 can work with the proper stuff instead of just being like, Oh, well, we have to redo this. Well, with Preacher, no, I was on set for that. So I had some um input on that, obviously, that's why I'm there. I'm there for several reasons to help the director answer any questions or concerns that they may have, but also make sure that I'm getting everything I need from the day, from the shoot, for what we need to do when we go, when I go back to the office and finish the work. Those are the primary concerns that I have. First and foremost, though, it is to make sure that the director and the crew are comfortable in shooting anything related to visual effects because a lot of times it can become this kind of tense situation on set you know because a lot of directors just don't want to deal with that aspect of it but my my job is to educate them and make them feel comfortable using it so i try to be there when i can sometimes we'll work on a show where there's already a production supervisor attached so we're kind of for lack of a better word, we're at their mercy of how they, they decided to shoot the elements. And then we get the elements and then we put them together to the best of our ability. Sometimes we have to augment them. We come back and tell them that, and it's, well, this, this explosion is not going to work because it doesn't quite match the angle or perspective for what's needed versus the foreground plate. Things like that can occur, but that's all part of, you know, what I do. We've spent a lot of time talking about explosions. Yes. Uh, what is your favorite visual effect to do? I mean, obviously they're all unique and it's all dependent on like what you're working on, but like, what's your favorite? Uh, like you, you know, somebody's like, all right, Kevin, this is what we're doing. And you're like, yes. Or yeah. is, is it all like that? I can be that. That was the nice thing about working on preacher is it was kind of all that, you know, over the course of the three seasons that we worked on the show, you know, we got to blow up this church. We got to do a lot of crazy gore type work, you know, whether it be headshots and just blood and the fights. I mean, I'm really proud of the pilot episode of Preacher because it had everything in it. You know, the introduction of each of the main characters were big set pieces, you know, 
Cassidy was fighting in a Learjet. All the blood in that fight was added by us. There was no practical blood on wow. the day. Okay. Yeah. And all the weapons that were thrown, those were those were CG. So things like that is great. The Tulip's intro sequence in the cornfield, I went out to this, oh, I'm trying to remember the city, way out there on the border of Nevada and California to shoot in the cornfield. And so we, sh we shot plates. And, you know, so that was a lot of green screen work and plate work. And then we did a map painting of Russia for one of the sequences in the film. And it was just a lot of, and over the course of season one, you know, doing, you know, Cassidy burning when he comes out into the sun, that was fun CG work, you know, once again, working with Houdini and the artist on that and creating that kind of nasty look. So I really enjoyed those types of shows that give me kind of a good variety of effects to work on rather than it just being a one trick pony. Gotcha. Or it's just like a CG character all the time. So don't get me wrong. CG characters are great. I had a great time working on Jack the Giant Killer, you know, with those massive CG giants, you know. And so that was that was a, a very fun and fulfilling film to work on for me. So I've been through your IMDb a few times. And mm -hmm. one of the things that strikes me is because you considered comic books as a potential career, mm -hmm. but you've worked on all these comic book type shows. Yeah. I mean, whether it's Preacher or agents of shield and you yeah. worked on a spider-man movie like you've yeah. done all these things is this it like this is your career is there anything and you did the orville so while, while you haven't done star wars you've done some good space you know space right. stuff like is there any i don't know genre or like piece outside of maybe because i'm gonna guess this like a godzilla movie mm -hmm. um that you would like still to do yeah i mean ultimately it's funny you asked that. Yeah. Cause you know, for me, and it's probably just because of when I was born and just my age, you know, I would have told you probably 10 years ago, I wanted to work on a star Wars film or I want to work on an alien film, you know, those two and, and Godzilla to a lesser extent, cause they've only really done two new films more recently, but with star Wars and alien, both they've kind of drifted from what I liked about them. Okay. So, you know, I haven't felt like I missed out because I didn't work on episodes, you know, one, two or three or seven, eight or nine, to be quite honest. A good friend of mine worked, he was the supervisor on seven, eight and nine. And I love the work in it, but the films just don't resonate with me the, the way episodes four, five and six did. Same with the, the alien films, you know, Covenant and Prometheus. So I think I've been fortunate where I had opportunities early on in, to work on that Roland Emmerich Godzilla film. You know, I went in, interviewed for it. You know, I was going to be a comp supervisor on it. And then uh, <laughs> I hope this doesn't get me into trouble, but I remember seeing the maquette. I forget what scale it was, but they had a maquette of, of the actual Godzilla that they were doing CG for the film. Yeah. And it, my gut reaction to it was not, good you know i don't even know if i had a poker face at that moment <laughs> when they showed it to me because i just i was looking at an oversized iguana and so that kind of was like okay no i can't you know that's uh, yeah that's i that to me like i i have an appreciation for that film because it it's it but but godzilla is like not even part of it like for me yeah. that movie is independence day meets jurassic park yeah and, it's a monster and, film. and in in that way, I feel like it, it's great to watch. Like it's it's yes. exactly the popcorn flick you want it to be. But as a yeah. Godzilla film, no. it like it, if if that was, I I feel like that movie would have done so much better if it wasn't named Godzilla. I I agree because there were so I many totally purists that were like, and rightly yeah. so, but there were so many purists that were like, oh, this is not good, and it just, yeah. um, so I. I, yeah. I get what you're saying because if they show you like like if if they didn't tell you it was a Godzilla film and they showed you that figure, I, you would have been like, "Well, that looks cool." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would have been exactly, you know, because you know, like I said, I grew up with it, so exactly, you have this, and then to your point, don't get me wrong, they took risks, you know, they they took a calculated risk going going the way that they did. And I, res I respect that sometimes, you know, it's like, okay, I see what you're doing. You don't want to just kind of like 
copy paste reuse kind of thing you know what i mean so i understood what they were trying to do in terms of trying to make it fresh and you're right i mean i don't consider myself but there were there are a lot to, even to this day even with the new godzilla films purists out there that uh, i'm a fan i don't consider myself a purist okay but um just something about it i i rely on my gut for a lot of the choices that i do and a lot of the kind of getting back to your question about if there's a genre or if there's something out there that I want to work on right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing, you know, we went through so many years beginning with 1993 and super Mario brothers. We're seeing video game movies make their way into cinema and they're starting to be done at a higher level. And it's not just enough about polish, but also good stories. Sure. There's numerous video game properties in the work in terms of even episodic series that I'm interested in. And films as well. Things like Metal Gear Solid, okay. uh, which is going right now. Things like that. And I'm also attracted to certain types of directors, you know. For me, I would love to work on a Christopher Nolan film. I have great respect for him and just the way he thinks. He's another director that does like to shoot as much as he can in camera. Once again, I have deep respect for that. But he does utilize CG, you know. Um I'm a huge fan of the John Wick films, you know, and the last film, Parabellum, had copious amounts of visual effects in it, but they didn't, they don't talk about it. You know, digital doubles are very popular now. And now with the advent of things like the Irishman, and we're still trying to get to that, trying to beat the uncanny valley where the, the digital creation just still has this kind of look to it that isn't quite right, isn't quite human. But we are getting there, and I think in particular video game technology, you know, Unreal Engine, if you're familiar with that, they just yeah. they just unveiled their um, Unreal Engine 5, and it's just stunning what is achievable. And that Unreal Engine 4 is being used to create backgrounds and assets for the Mandalorian, which is fantastic, you know, and it's going to cut down – once it gets to the point where that can be mass produced, it's going to cut down on production time, you know, which is going to help immensely, you know, and it also solved issues of like, okay, do we need to travel to Africa or Russia to get this? Now we can create the assets inside Unreal Engine 4, have them ready, bring the actors on the light stage and shoot them with those assets and make lighting changes on the fly. It's just remarkable what's being done nowadays. So with where we are, I'm not necessarily the most inside cinephile. So I know that as an example, Lord of the Rings changed everything for visual effects. But is there something else that you, as someone in the industry, is there another film or franchise like Lord of the Rings, either before it or after it, that really like changed the game? Because I remember, and Peter Jackson was, you know, the first to say like, we're yeah. utilizing visual effects like a as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the reasons I know how extensive the visual effects were on those things. And mm -hmm. I also know that, you know, everybody took, jackson's talking points and then started talking to other people and other directors who were like yeah no they're changing the game is there right. something else that like you know within the industry was like a game changer that like we wouldn't know oh i don't know no i don't hmm, trying to think or is it when those things happen like no like the director or the head of visual like they know to like put this in the pr packet and like it's just yeah. out there to everybody yeah a good example of that is you know for a while there in the 90s visual effects wise there weren't a lot of like you know fantastic visual effects films to, to be quite honest you know it wasn't until well I, i'd rather actually I'd probably say late 80s early 90s it wasn't until 93 when Jurassic Park came out and when not even the Brachiosaurus, it wasn't until the T-Rex shot that I knew, oh my God, okay, we're seeing a new level. We're seeing, you know, not the death of stop motion animation, but we're, you know, yeah. because that was a fight, the, the inner turmoil to make that movie. I mean, that was going to be Phil Tippett's film and, you know, it was all going to be stop motion, you know, and, 
don't get me wrong, I adore Phil Tippett in the work done in Dragon Slayer and The Empire Strikes Back and all that stuff just to this day still blows my mind. But when the T-Rex breaks out of his paddock in that shot, that was that was a game changer. Another one for me that people I feel don't talk about enough because I feel it's an even more authentic and more realistic looking character than even Gollum was Davy Jones in Pirates of the Caribbean 2. Okay. Yeah. Davy Jones was groundbreaking. I mean, that was just like, oh my God. That just, I remember seeing that on the screen for the first time and just being blown away. So, to your point, I think when there are big shifts, big changes in visual effects, no, for the most part, they do the right thing and they make sure to get that out there, you know, to say, hey, look at this, you know, in case in point, like I spoke about the Mandalorian, you know, they're talking about not CG characters, but they're talking about how they're changing the way things are filmed, yeah. you know, which is huge, very different. A lot of times we talk about things like, you know, the T-Rex in Jurassic Park or David Jones or Gollum, but it could be a plethora of things. I mean, I'm, I don't know when, but with this new technology for Mandalorian, I'm, and with looking at Unreal Engine 5, we're going to probably finally see the death of like blue screen, green screen compositing because, you know, a lot of that now will be attainable in camera, still utilizing visual effects, but you'll have your foreground actors and whatever other set props you need. And then the background will be pre-rendered using game engines like Unreal 5 and just offering DPs and the crew just limitless opportunities to change things on the fly and record it all in one shot. So there's a lot of just interesting stuff on the horizon and, you know, digital humans are advancing, you know, um, another good one to talk about just briefly was Gemini man was a film. It didn't do well at the box office, but that was a film that had been percolating in the industry for, I remember first hearing about that in the mid nineties Okay, and they were talking about Mel Gibson, Harrison Ford, but the tech wasn't there. It just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. Couldn't do it. We couldn't de-age that person. You know, they talked about doing it to the traditional makeup, but it wasn't going to be enough because you also had to thin the actor out in a lot of instances and things like that and change the bone structure and the way the skin, you know, so Gemini Man is a perfect example of something that, you know, took decades to get it to that point, you know, and that's just going to be the kind of thing that's just going to keep going. So it's going to be interesting to see what what's on the horizon for films and TV series, you know, coming down in the years ahead. So are we at a point where Gemini Man will never have to wait another decade? Like, are we at a point now where we're at that point? I don't want to say limitless, but that's what right. I mean. Like we're at that limitless, like, all right, here's my movie pitch. Yeah. We can do it. Like there is no, well, maybe the technology is not there. Like are, have, have we arrived? Are we close? I think we're close. Okay. Yeah. I, th- I don't think we're, I don't think you go in a studio and pitch a all CG digital human film versus actors at this point yet. I think the only person that can do that is James Cameron. Okay. And he's doing it. Um, I mean, the whole, you know, Avatar sequels, it's a whole, it's going to be a whole plethora of technology that we haven't even seen yet that's going to be unveiled when those films finally debut. Um, so I think he's the rare exception, you know, but I think by and large, we're still quite not there uh, yet. Because case in point, I just read an article about George Miller, speaking of Mad Max, where his next film after that, I think the one he's doing was going to be the Furiosa film. And he thought about using Charlize again and then just de-aging her. But he felt, even with seeing the Irishman, that the technology still wasn't there yet. Okay. So he is actually pursuing casting a different actress to play the role. So it's very much, like I said, dependent on the director's point of view of it and studios as well because right now it's still an expensive process to undertake is that the other shoe to drop is once we get this technology like any other technology it does come down i mean silicon graphics back in the day were it 
And then it wasn't yeah. until Jobs comes around um, with whatever he created. I, I'm blanking on the name um, that he sold to Pixar yes. um, yeah. as machines that were not Silicon graphics. And right. then those started to come down in price. So I mm -hmm. guess like where, it, and it'll never be like a $50 price like program. Like I understand that, right. but at a certain point, you know, maybe in two decades, I will be able to reasonably say, all right, I can spend a couple grand, not a hundred thousand, about a couple grand on getting that kind of unreal engine software and independent movies will get a shot in the arm as far as visual effects. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't know, for me, independent movie means it was all shot that that's, and, and maybe that's just that's, my head, right. but for the most part, independent mm -hmm. movies, you know, maybe they get a visual effect like right. one. Uh, yeah. So, so we'll start seeing probably better quality or more, or just more visual effects in independent yeah. film going yeah. forward. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's to the point now, even your, your most basic rom-com, has some visual effects on it, you know, even television series, you know, have visual effects on it, you know, driving comps are staple, you know? So it is the kind of thing that it's frustrating though. Cause one of the things that has happened lately is, you know, I was talking about like back in 93, 94, a wire removal would have cost like five, six, seven grand. Now you won't get the work unless your wire removal is like 500 bucks. Oh, okay. Thing. And that has more deeper and lasting impacts uh, with what I do. And, you know, when a movie is done, except for films like Star Wars, you know, where, or Lord of the Rings, where you know a visual effects house associated with those films, you know, you know, ILM is going to work on Star Wars. But even ILM, you look at the credits of the recent films, there's about three or four or five other facilities underneath them. Sure. And everything's done through a bidding process. So you have to be, not always, but a lot of times you have to come in under um, the thing that's killing us right now are all these incentives that other countries are giving, you know, go to Canada and you get 25%, you so know. It's, it's, um, so films have become the space agency, the NASA, right? Like it's that great quote from uh, what the right stuff, mm -hmm. like we're, we're, or I think it's the right stuff. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting on a rocket built by the, lowest oh, yeah. bidder yeah right yeah so so is that that that's movies now yeah and it's tough too because the other thing that i don't want to get too deep into it uh but you know i think we're one of the only you know departments or disciplines in the film industry that isn't unionized you know is that so the, coming we've talked about it and talked about it it's it seems weird that visual effects artists as a as a group you know in in numerous nations would not be able to make this happen but it's just it's just weird how it hasn't, you know, but it hasn't. And people talk about it, talk about it, and talk about it, but there's just no action. I don't see it happening anytime soon. So that's also a part of our struggle to maintain our bottom lines and try to be profitable in this industry. You know, I like my job, but there are plenty of people who are owners of visual effects facilities. I would never, never want to own a visual effects facility. Because it's just really hard to maintain it, and especially when you have an army of people that you're responsible for, it's so difficult because you have to be cutthroat, and um, it's just <laughs> it's it's really harder than it should be. All right, so we've gone through the whole process. Mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about your origins. What movies like are your faves? Right, mm. like what are your you know, they don't even have to have visual effects. Just, right. you know, you want to watch a movie. Like what, what are your go-tos? Oh yeah. Let's see. I'd have to say, Oh, I can watch every Christmas. I watch Die Hard. Okay. Love that movie. Um, the original, I love a lot of the early McTiernan stuff, you know, Predator, the Hunter for Red October. I am into the genre type stuff. You know, like I told you, I like the John Wick series. But I like a movie like it was just on the other day on TBS or something, The Shawshank Redemption. I'll stop and watch that. It's just, you know, fascinating film. And anything from 
out of all of Nolan's films, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm most struck by Inception. Okay. Um, I love that film. I love all his films, but I love that one in particular. Um, I'm trying to think of some other good ones that, you know, it's funny. As soon as I hang up, I'll remember. Um, <laughs> that I mean, that's how it works. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, but no, they don't have to be visual effects driven to, you know, to get me to watch them. I'm a big fan. I like the Godfather. I like the original Jaws. Oh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, huge fan of that film. Um, not so much of the, the other films, but. Um, Is there like, do you, when you're watching for research versus mm-hmm. just watching for pleasure, is yeah. is it a different kind of viewing? Like, you, you know what I mean? Like if I said, okay, watch Raiders of the Lost Ark for, yeah. for inspiration. Like, are you watching it differently than it's on and I want to enjoy a movie? Yeah, sometimes it is because sometimes it'll be things like um, looking at, okay, why did they choose that camera angle? Why did they go with, a, you know, a dolly? You know, why is it locked off? Why isn't the camera moving? So in that case, what will happen is my brain will just concentrate on that and it won't necessarily pay attention to the, the actors or what's, okay. you know, what's being said or, you know, what have you. But usually I'm doing that with films I've already seen, you know, underwater, like I said, that one I hadn't seen, but I went in and I was able to appreciate multiple aspects of the film. You know, the production design was really solid. I'm not a fan of Kristen Stewart per se, but you know, she didn't take me out of the film at all. And I was mostly there for the creature work, but that didn't come until later the film. So I got to watch other aspects of it. Okay. Um, and I watched the other day. I watched a really bad film, <laughs> Shark Attack Three. Horrible, John Barrowman. I highly recommend it if you want. To, if you want a good laugh, okay. Shark Attack Three Megalodon. Because what was interesting about that watching that is, I was having a good time watching how bad it was, but I just couldn't get over the fact that everything was shot as close-ups. You know, so just close-ups on every actor's face, and just normally I wouldn't be looking for it, but it was so obtrusive it was just it was impossible to avoid but i got a kick out of that so i'm able to turn it off you know until i see something that just whoa i wasn't expecting but it took me out case in point a movie one of my favorites that i adore i didn't mention was logan flawless work flawless work in that film up to the point where they're in um professor x logan and the girl are in a car and just the car comps, I just immediately just, I was totally invested in the film. And then we get to this car comps in, in broad daylight and rural countryside. And it just kind of struck me as off, you know? And unfortunately, those are the kinds of things that usually get me because, you know, we talked about bad visual effects. A lot of times it's not the artist's fault. A lot of times it's a studio mandate or it's a director mandate where in this case, the car comps, the best car comps to me, you know, if you're just real quick, if you're shooting inside a car, you're exposing the film for the car and the interior, which means anything outside the car is going to be brighter than normal. Okay. But a yeah. lot of times what will happen is that's just basic film, you know, yeah. whether it's still or moving. But a lot of times what will happen is a director or a studio head will be like, well, wait a minute, that we're paying for that background outside that window. We want to see that. And it's like, well, it's there. It's just you want it to look, you want them to look integrated. You want to look like it was shot in camera. If you, you know, otherwise you, you don't do that. Or a lot of times they don't like blur or motion blur on it. Yeah. So it's things like that. It seems very simple. A car comp sounds very, you know, what we call A over B. It is, but you'd be amazed at how a movie that you see, man, that had really bad visual effects. You'd be surprised how many times the visual effects were actually phys- were driven that way. You know, it isn't always, oh my god, we ran out of time, or oh my god, we ran out of money. Sometimes it's honestly just being pushed that way by the powers that be. So. So there's a quote from Futurama that keeps being relevant in and around myself and those I know. 
From Futurama's fourth season, episode eight, titled Godfellas, Bender is talking to the God entity when the entity states, when you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. That quote is relevant to almost every aspect of our lives in some capacity, but when Kevin and I were discussing the idea that most people notice only bad visual effects more than the good, that quote came back to me. Another thing of note is that we spoke at length of Unreal Engine and what it can do for video games, which is almost everything, and what it might mean for visual effects, which could very well mean everything. What this means? Well, we touched on some possibilities, but truly no one really knows it until it happens. Use cases for technology when it seems unlimited tend to be more running first and walking second. A very, let's see what this thing can do mentality at the very forefront of all technologies. And this is just one example. So I guess we'll we'll wait and see. But what I find most impressive and I'm in a bit awe of Kevin is two things really. First, that the cold calling didn't dissuade him from going after what he wanted and that he didn't overdo it either. And second, he went for what he wanted. It's easy in hindsight to say, good job, Kev, you made it. But his story rings true to most people who are doing what they want to be doing. They had to go for it. You might fall into something different, a side industry here or there, but you have to take the shot. Cliché as it is, you really do miss all of the shots you don't take. So, what is it you are looking to avoid? What shots are you not taking? And if I can be of any help? You know where to reach me. Thanks for listening to The Palmer Files, episode 20. As a reminder, all links are available in the show notes. And now for the official business. The Palmer Files releases every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you're still listening, I encourage you to join the discussion. You can tweet me at Agent Palmer. You can tweet the show at The Palmer Files. And you can tweet Kevin at Fuchipatas. That's F-U-C-H-I-P-A-T-A-S. You can see his complete career credits on IMDb or his demo reel, which are both linked in the show notes. Plus, as always, don't forget you can see all of my writings and rantings on agentpalmer.com. Email can be sent to the show at thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. If you have any feedback on this or any previous episode, or if there's a topic or guest you'd like me to consider. You can also hear more of me in the meantime on Our Liner Notes, a musical conversation podcast with host Chris Meyer, and my other gig is co-host of the podcast Digest with Dan Lizette. question for me yes what if you have one visual effects film that you really like what what would that film be i feel like i've used this as an answer for a lot of favorites for myself but i almost feel like i have to go with like wizards oh um, by ralph bakshi because there is some first of all that is probably one of my it's easily one of my top five favorite films of all time okay yeah Uh, but there's something about the and I, I feel like uh, I'm beating a dead horse. There's something about the authentic nature by which the or like the classic rotoscoping is done. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's wizards. It's Bakshi's Lord of the Rings. It's yep. like the original Snow White that you worked like like yep. that kind of stuff. Like there's something authentic about it, and I feel like what? it's the maybe for me it's the imperfections. I mean, I I'm a I'm a child that grew up in the the eighties and into the nineties. So the cartoons I grew up with were all hand-drawn animation. So that original rotoscoping being hand-drawn and just growing up on, you know, Thundercats and He-Man and Transformers like that were not perfect. You know, they, they weren't crisp, you know, 90 degree angles on stuff. And, and, you know, swords came to a point kind of, 
Mm-hmm. So like I go back to like Wizards and I like that it, for me is like a comfort film that like I will always go to for not only inspiration, but it's just I look at it as like it's perfect in its imperfection. Like it's artistic. Um, yes. It's it's not an art film, but yet no. it's artistic. And that's yeah. to me, that's, that's the one. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I respect that. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how we yeah, we've gotten away from that, but there was that heyday of those types of films and that type of look that was just really unique and really iconic. And it, it's a shame that you don't really, you don't really see that anymore. No, the, what the closest thing would have been, uh, undone, uh, yeah. Amazon, which as great as that was, mm-hmm. like it, it felt polished. Like, I mean, it just, it is still rotoscoping, but it's not, it felt like computer rotoscoping. Like they, like they just ran a filter over everything. And I, I know that's not necessarily what they did, but right. it just, it, I know what you're it wasn't yeah. imperfect enough, I guess. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah. 